me to oh i'm unmuted yes thank you very much matt Stephen. that was wonderful that was absolutely glorious thank you thank so you. much thank you now uh i'm in a very paradoxical situation here because up to two years ago i would have uh i read hapgood back in the 1970s when i was having my oxford education and uh, I have more of one, frankly, than Farrell does. Farrell is a serious scholar, and I have a great repu uh, respect for him. But he doesn't go into specifics on anything. He is a wonderful gatherer of information, rather like a 19th century or early 20th century scholar like Lewis Spence, who, again, is not to be despised. And far from it, these men are giants. But in the past 70 years, we can go a lot more specifically into the specifics of this stuff. Now, first, when I read Hapgood, I was already familiar with Velikovsky. And Velikovsky is, uh, you can read all of his work for free online uh, uh, at the Emanuel Velikovsky Archive, or I, V Archive, I think it is, dot com. And it, it is just a couple of clicks away. And it is quite remarkable stuff because he doesn't just agree. He didn't just beat Hapgood by decades to the catastrophism theory. He comes up with a mechanism, which is for why the upheavals happened. And his mechanism is central to Matt's central philosophical points of as above, so below. And as in macrocosm, so in microcosm. Because Velikovsky's concept is that the solar system and all solar systems are electrical, basically, in nature. And that uh, when uh, planets move orbit, they, they, they can actually, it, when comets are ejected from planets and are the equivalent of pro photons conceptually being emitted by atoms, and when planet, planets do change orbit, even within the human record in spaces of thousands of years, not billions or millions of years. So, of course, he also challenges Darwin, the mechanism, he accepts evolution, but the uh, mechanism for evolution is not the childish one and the brutal one of natural selection. It is caused by living beings adapting to rapidly changing environments. Rather than evolution, we should talk about catastrophic evolution, or we should talk about a catastrophic adaptation to radically different environments. And today, of course, we have 70 years of research in molecular biology, which incredibly shows us that the descendants of dinosaurs flourish among us to this day as birds and turkeys and chickens. Now, that's incredible. 95 to 97 percent of the DNA of chickens and turkeys is velociraptors or tyrannosauruses. This is well established. Look it up. This is exactly we smile. But uh, we take our revenge on dinosaurs and Jurassic Park every day whenever we eat an egg. <laughs> but it's actually scientifically established. But how can this be? And also, how can it be, as my friend Ted Holden, who makes, uh, Steve, he makes you and me look like positive champions of the conventional by the, uh, this guy, by the daringness of his thoughts. But he points out the obvious. 180 ton monsters roamed the earth in the Jurassic. We find bigger and larger land dinosaurs every year. This is a common place. Yet in our world, no land creature larger than ten, heavier than 10,000 pounds existed. When they have water to support them, that's another story. You have whales, which we probably wouldn't believe could exist if we didn't see them commonly. But on land, nothing larger than an elephant more or less, exists. There may be 20 foot long sloths, but they probably, uh, in the Amazon jungle, is evidence for that. Uh, uh, still alive today, actually. The natives believe it, and I'm a great believer and supporter of native people's traditions wherever you look in the world. But why are there no larger creatures than an elephant in the world anywhere whatsoever today? Either gravity, gravity must have changed. This is very radical, right? But uh, I don't want to stay too long on, on, on Velikovsky. That's a whole different subject for itself. And actually, I, you suggested to me, Matt, now I'd still like to follow up on it. I should have followed up with you before. I was too busy with other stuff. But I'd like to pitch a session, not directly on Velikovsky, but on a man I think nobody has ever heard of in the West. You find virtually nothing about him uh, online. 
And it's not a cover up. It's that he's just outside the, 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 the conventional area of perception. The CIA, as far as I know, hasn't even bothered trying to repress him. He was a, the son of a Russian clergyman, of a Russian Orthodox priest, and he became director of Kiev Observatory in the 1930s and ran it for almost half a century. And he's one of the greatest astrophysical scientists and theorists who ever lived, and nobody in the West knows anything about him, partly because of his name, because it's difficult to spell and even more difficult to pronounce. Sergei Konstantinovich Vesiechsviatsky. Spell that without any Ys, it's easier. V S E K H. S V S C X V V I A T S K I I, and I may have gotten that wrong. So, I, you know, if so, I apologize. But as early as the 1930s, he calculated the orbits of comets. He calculated the rotational speed uh, uh, and energy balances of the gas giant planets, and he concluded that all our small terrestrial planets are ejected. Uh, out of, they started life as comets, and all that, that there is no Cooper cometary belt. It's a figment of human imagination. We had no evidence for it. We just assumed it for the last 70 years since Gerard Coop, C Keeper, who incidentally did consulting work for the CIA as well. It's amazing how many scientists who we are now supposed to acclaim the 1940s and early 50s did, quote unquote, consulting work for the agency back then. I knew one of them, a truly evil son of a bitch called Alfred de Grazia, who wrote the psychological manuals for the CIA in the 1940s and attached himself to Velikovsky as his best friend in the 1960s through 70s. Right? and now has a star in his honor on the floor of the, C of, of the agency in Langley. You know, the, the weird ironies and interconnections you find with all these people are amazing, right? But what the Sieksvi Atsky argued, and he was a friend of Velikovsky's, I don't believe they ever had the chance to physically meet, but they corresponded warmly over 20 years, was that if you look at the orbits of comets, they all pass to, uh, uh, around gas giant planets very closely and actually primarily Jupiter and Saturn. And he concludes they come from them. They are rejected by them. Now, in the 1930s and 40s, his theories were rejected and so far as they were noted in the West at all for very interesting reason. Nobody was, uh, uh, was seriously applying nuclear theory yet to astrophysical processes. And even when they began to, when Isidore Rabi won his Nobel Prize for uh, you know, developing models for thermonuclear fusion in uh, uh, process and fusion in the sun, we have assumed as a matter of faith, not science, that the sun is a constant, which comes back to, to your work, Stephen, because we are terrified of the thought that the sun actually fluctuates and is therefore unpredictable. But if the sun alone fluctuates in its energy levels, even without catastrophes in space, this explains many of the variations we see in uh, global records, history, tradition, uh, dendrochronology, uh, the, the work that's only started to be done in reconstructing the chronology of the ecosphere through looking at tree rings, which is really only reliable back six or 700 years, and even then it becomes incredibly patchy. Why does it become patchy? We don't know, there is no explanation for this. Uh, uh, if you want to look up the best expert on this, I think he's still alive, hopefully. My fellow Northern Irishman, and I actually have never met him, but his work is most interesting, Professor Mike Bailey, B-I-L-L-I-E. And he isn't afraid to go into catastrophism, at least superficially. And he's the world's leading expert on dendrochronology. And he can't bring it back more than about 1500 years. And he can't bring it back definitively more than 700 years before fluctuations start coming in. Now, the one other point I want to make coming back to Stephen, if I may, is to throw out one other idea for discussion among us. As I say, I bought everything that Hapgood said and that Stephen has so accurately and beautifully delineated for us uh, until only a couple of years ago. But there is a website, and it contains stuff which I frankly regard as crackpot, as well as brilliant. You, you know, it's both there together, and we'd all come up with uh, different uh, conclusions on it. But the website is called Malaga Bay. 
www.thepublicdomain.com. It's written, it's put out by a guy called Tim Cullen, who I think lives now literally at Malaga in Spain, hence the name of his, um, and he's basically a neo-catastrophist because where Velikovsky says his last planetary-wide catastrophe, which is confirmed in archeology span as well as geology, would have been about 700 BC. Uh, uh, Colin and his, uh, and his collaborators bring it forward much more during that they advance it to 2000 years. What they basically say is, and there's one more name I'll throw out, uh, I hope he's still alive, I've never met him, but he's an obscure genius in Germany called Herbert Illig, I-L-L-I-G. And Illig traces catastrophes that un upended civilization as recently as 230 AD, destroying the classical Roman Empire and discrediting uh, the, the worship of the, of the pagan gods, leading to the rise and triumph of Christianity under the Byzantines. He traces another one, which Mike Bailey confirms from paleochronology in the time of the Emperor Justinian, which is also the time of King Arthur in Britain. A very puzzling time, because in England, uh, post-Roman Britain ceases to exist. The Saxons take over, but neither the surviving Britons who only survive in Wales and Ireland, nor the Saxons talk about it as a genocide. It's as if the whole population was annihilated, a new population moves in. And yet the survivors of the old population do not look on the new people the way the Jews and the Russians looked on the Germans, say, after World War II, or the way the Palestinians looked on the Israelis. We're not talking about a civilization being annihilated by another invader. We're talking about a civilization being annihilated just like that. And then the invader comes in and takes over an empty land where everyone has conveniently been wiped out, but not by them. Now, finally, what I want to come up to this is the origin of our portolanos. This is a radical idea I'm new with myself, but it's this. When we apply Occam's razor to anything, and from my Oxford education, I think a lot of Occam's razor, look for the simplest, most direct explanation and the least convoluted one. And if you don't have evidence to support an assumption, be very skeptical about that assumption. Now, Hapgood made two assumptions which I swallowed for 50 years. And they were first, he isn't a catastrophist. Uh, he assumes the dates that are given to him by regular scientists. When they say Iceland, Greenland was free of ice only 100,000 or more years ago, he believes that. But we know for a fact that Greenland's coasts at least were totally free of ice only seven and 800 years ago in the period of the Maunder Minimum. The world was much warmer then than it is now. The Vikings settled in Greenland and they called it Greenland. They didn't call it Iceland they, or Snowland. They called it Greenland and they flourished there for 300 years before they had to leave. The weather changed. During those same years, it was quite simply physically impossible to sail further south than Cape Bojador on the west coast of Africa because it was too hot and the seas were too volcanic. And there was a genuine terror and well-established fear of sea monsters coming to the surface and wrecking ships that was taken for granted by all regular scholars as well as seamen until 1433, as late as that. That is the date that Gil Yanis, the most legendary and first great Portuguese pioneer the navigator sails south of Cape Bojado, and the, it, it has the greater impact on Europe than Yuri Gagarin's flight or Neil Armstrong's landing on the moon did in the past century for us. Why? Why? And when I looked into this very recently, I was challenged by a well-meaning friend who was a lifelong catastrophist himself. Uh, he said, well, I, I'm skeptical of that because surely the West African societies on the coasts of West Africa would record this. And what I have discovered is there's no evidence that there were advanced civilizations on the coast of West Africa at all until the 15th century. The African kingdoms previously trade in slaves with the Middle East and the, the Muslim world. But their transatlantic trade or their Atlantic area trade only begins in the 16th century. With the, Port uh, with the Portuguese and the Spanish and then the British on an enormous scale, of course. 
but there is no evidence archaeologically or historically for complex societies on the coasts of West Africa. Now, this isn't because the people were stupid or less evolved than us. There were complex societies in Zimbabwe, in Ghana, and in Mali inside the African continents, but not on the coast. Why? The evidence we seem to have is that environmentally, while jungle life could grow, it was simply too hot, inconceivably, for human beings to live there and sustain themselves more than on brief explorations and visits. As recently as the 14th century. Hey, Marty? The final point I want to make, but you know, before I got all these points here, is this: uh, on Collins' site, one of the points Illig makes, uh, Herbert Illig, the, the German radical genius is that if you are to look at the maps of uh, Claudius Pompeo, Pompeo, uh, Pompeii, and uh, they look ridiculous by our standards, but if you look at them in terms of what we knew the past to have been in what we assume was tens and hundreds of thousands of years ago, or as Stephen was saying, when the water levels were lower than, for example, the weird distortion of Northern Britain and Scotland into the, that looks so ludicrous to our eyes into the North Sea, but we now know that those lands contained human habitation tens of thousands of years ago, or even more recently, it's known as Dogger Land. You can look it up. The, the concept of, an, of, of, of a civilization and human society then being submerged by the North Sea within human times is very recent. It, it goes back less than 20, 20 years, but we now accept it. But what could have caused this and how recently could it have been? Illich's suggestion is this, and uh, I think it applies to these maps, and I'll finish here. It is that in Roman times and earlier, the maps of Claudius Pompey were an accurate reflection of the wor Western world as it was at the time that we have had upheavals that changed the maps of the world to our current identity. And by the same token, the map of Peri Reis and the map, the Portolano maps that Hapgood found do not go back to ancient times, though most certainly there were most advanced civilizations then. But we, we have to take that on assumption. We do, the earlier maps are like Claudius Pompey's. The evidence points for We don't have a chain of evidence in legal and historical terms. We don't have original evidence. We don't have best evidence. We have assumptions. But if you shave with Occam's razor, what seems more likely is that the Portolano maps, and, uh, including the maps of Antarctica and Greenland, were actually made within the past thousand years. And the reason they're called Portolanos also is they originally came from Portugal, which was the first great Western maritime navigational civilization half a century, uh, not quite half a century, but certainly a quarter of a millennium before the, 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 the English were. The Templars went there at, when they fled France after 13 to 1. You're clearly familiar with this, Stephen. But the very name of the nation Portugal means Port of the Grail, which is hugely significant because it points to both the Templars going there and the fact that it's a port, a, a port, a Portolano, Portuguese maritime civilization. And excavations carried out over the past 30 years have quite clearly established that not only Western Europeans, but specifically the Templars, were in Nova Scotia, were on Oka Island, yep. did, uh, uh, did interact and even help form tribes like the Mi'kmaqs in what is now Eastern Canada. And of course, Nova Scotia we find on Portolanos. We find it on Zeno's map of the north, as you say yourself. So my final suggestion is that these wonderful, remarkable maps were actually made thousands of years later than Hapgood assumed. It's not that there weren't great ancient civilizations. There were. And the tradition of using uh, Alexandria and Egypt as a, as a base for, for global projections would have come from them. And, uh, but uh, uh, that tradition, uh, I mean, to this day, we find Mercator projections and projections pioneered in Greenwich, England, are still used in Japan, in China, in Russia, all around the world. And therefore, it would be natural for a, a, an early medieval civilization in Portugal that was making maps with advanced technology sufficient. Uh, 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 Marty, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I, I'll finish now. But yeah. there, uh, you're right, of course, Matt. I make my point. I think I threw one out quite a lot there. But I, I, I look forward to future feedback on this one, too. Thank you. Stephen, do you have any uh, thoughts? Yeah.
just very quickly, I mean, uh, Hapgood himself admitted that he could not discover a causal mechanism for Earth crust displacement, so that it's open to discussion. Uh, and certainly there's possibilities or errors. I mean, I've, I've presented Hapgood's maps without criticism, and there's certainly uh, uh, grounds for that. Very briefly on, on one of Marty's later thoughts, um, regardless of, of what antiquity the maps are, and of course it's debatable, if the uh, transmission route of that is via Egypt and the mystery schools and the priesthoods, uh, what that brings to mind, bearing in mind what Marty said about Templars in Nova Scotia, that brings to mind Exodus and the original French Knights that went on to found the Templars, uh, when they were digging under the Temple Mount, I'm going to suggest that they actually knew that there was a cache of not treasure in the sense of gold, although there may have been, I think there was treasure in the sense of information. So they're obviously, this is speculative. I'm going to suggest that uh, when the Romans sacked Jerusalem 69 AD timeframe, um, people with knowledge of this escaped the Mediterranean world south of France and they went back when the opportunity afforded itself. And indeed, that might be the real genesis for the Crusades in the first place. Mm. So, but again, speculative. Mm. Interesting. Um, Pip, we, we have some, some very interesting questions lining up in the queue, but I'm going to call on Pip next. Go for it. Can you hear me? Uh, indeed, we can. Yes. You can? Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Stephen. Wow, that's so amazing. It was just brilliant. Um, I wanted to ask you where you thought the faces from the Ibn Benzara map came from. Where do you think they're from? Um, it, it makes sense to me that um, that was either a direct copy from this notional normal Portolano and that whatever that origin or source map was, um, it would have resided in the library of Alexandria, my best guess. So the map that you're referring to when they were making a copy of it, I assumed uh, they stylistically introduced these four faces for the four winds based on the sort of Coptic thing. That's my, my best guess right now. But so you'd say, you'd say they're from um, the Middle East. Well, uh, yes, Alexandria, the library of Alexandria, if you will, the, the well, local region. Egypt, yeah. Yeah, okay. but, but again, that's speculative and, and uh, I'm hardly a scholar in the field. I'd like to say that, that the top one, they all have similar noses, but in particular, the, the top one, you've got a little thing on your presentation, the, uh, the four faces. Um, sorry, I'm looking at, at my book here. I'll, I'll um, hold it up. Is that that top one? Yeah. <laughs> Yay! Same book. Yeah, the top one, uh, it's hard yeah. to see if there's a beard there or just discoloration. But c could I just say, I always think they look Welsh because that is a classic. If, if you see a picture of a, what, uh, before we were PC'd, you know, the picture of a, Wel a Welsh witch and, and they had that distinct nose and then the distinct pointy chin. So it sounds bizarre, but then I have this book that, that perhaps you would be interested in reading. And it is reorganizing all the dates that we have. It's by two, I'll send the link or send if you want to read it, but it's two by two British guys. And they, they've used um, the names of what you want, Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett. But they've, um, have you got it? Yes. Yeah. What they've done is they started off wanting to know who King Arthur was and um, because he's known as a myth. Anyway, they found two. Um, there were two King Arthurs, but they, they used the old British manuscripts. And I can never the, remember the name, how to say it properly, like the, the, the um, Mabagungians or something. It was like the old British manuals. Um, that were actually written in um, Kulibran, which is the ancient Welsh language. Um, and these, uh, the entire history has been wiped from, from academia. But that the, um, uh, 
Britain was founded from a series of migrations from Syria. So if that sounds unbelievable, the books make it entirely believable. Oh. So, but, 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 but just coming back to so that's why I'm saying uh, that they could be Welsh. Uh, I, I would not discount the possibility that in, in antiquity, there were degrees of communication in the sense of uh, sea lines of communication far greater than modern thought will admit or, or contemplate. So I wouldn't yeah. certainly discount that possibility. And there are other interesting works uh, that suggest that the, the whole of uh, megalithic ruins around the British Isles and, and surrounding area are actually the result of an ancient civilization. And this gets into some fascinating concepts of the origin of the English system of measure, the only rational explanation we've ever found, which in turn ties into the civic planning of Washington, D.C. So um, I, I certainly would be open to sort of this concept that you're advancing, although um, it is difficult. Uh, one quick thought too, there's a Russian work that I haven't talked about and it's another heresy, but it's based on a Russian mathematician who saw patterns in dynasties. So if you look at the biblical kings, for example, and then other historical dynasties, and what this brilliant man did was uh, he applied statistics and he came up with a dynastic distance function and he came to the conclusion that modern chronology and history repeats a number of times. And so the, the entirety, and this gets to what Martin was perhaps suggesting, the entirety of recorded history is actually much shorter than we believe right now according to standard chronology. Yeah, and, this, that's what, and this could allow for the stuff that you're talking about too. Exactly what these guys say, these same historians, that the chronology of... Um, ancient Egypt is is out by about 800 years so it, it shortens everything yeah yeah so th there are other works that that uh, uh, argue that point of view yeah, yeah. Matt? A, uh, another thought uh, from Paul um, Paul would you like to um, to share your your concept uh, with the group If, if you're speaking, Paul, you're on mute. Okay, maybe he's having some trouble there. Uh, basically, Paul just wanted to share any ropes in the chat. Uh, okay, can you, can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Hey, Paul. Just, um, oh. I mean, it's something that um, I probably picked up from somewhere else. It's not an original thought. Um, the idea that the nature of substance has changed um, significantly over time um, and in a general con uh, the general concept is that everything which is now apparent has has emerged out of has come out of a, a time when there was no appear when and you find this in gen this is reflected in Genesis that first of all there's an idea and only later is there a manifestation of that idea, and that, and I think part of that is that the I, the idea, um, an evolutionary idea, that everything comes from the spirit, whatever, however we like to, to uh, understand that, and begins as non-manifest, and and then goes through a process of um, greater and greater. Um, densification or condensation um which we see you could say we see that in the dew drop in the morning the even if it's not it's not been raining somehow you, you get these wonderful dew drops in the in the leaves it's come from from um an ethereal realm and and becomes manifest in 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 the first place in water um so that's that's my concept, general concept, uh, um, way of looking at how things have come into being at all. Um, and of course, in in modern times, we've science has gone the other way um, <laughs> from taking what was you know the atomic theory, which was a a, a, a tiny ball of solid matter, um, that's been exploded, um, and now we we're looking for we know that, that nothing we touch is substantial in that old sense. Um, that's just one, one element to it. I, I was intrigued in a, in a sense by the absence of any mention of Atlantis, but I, I don't know whether, <laughs> whether that's um, 
not not a word to be mentioned in polite company. So that's that's all I would have to say. Well, Hapgood himself mused or, or wondered if uh, these this unknown civilization might have uh, evolved into the Phoenicians or possibly the Carthaginians. Uh, he did, didn't go down the Atlantis route, but but certainly you know if you if you look at that quote from Plato and Timaeus and you're willing to uh, credit it as having some basis in truth, uh, you could go down that realm. And in terms of your other observation, I'd probably defer to Matt or someone in terms of the more philosophical aspects of creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fine. Yeah, I mean, the, the thought that entered my mind as, as I heard you speak and I read your, your original question um, is that, you know, Max Planck, and he wrote a wonderful book, Max Planck, uh, called The Philosophy of Physics in 1938. And in it, he makes the point that um, one should always strive for looking for universal constants, which is what he did when he developed his insights and in, that, that became known as the Planck constant. Um, that opened a gateway, right? It, it, it opened a, a, I'm cutting out. Oh, oh okay, sorry. Um, okay. Um, sorry if that was an unintelligible what I just said, but basically, uh, Max Planck's insight into the nature of the quantum opened up a new domain of thinking, a new space for discoveries to be made, and he warned against people trying to formalize and and render absolute and crystallize the discoveries that he and others were making. Um, and he made a point, yes, there are, there are constants. They allow for these, these new degrees of freedom to explore and, and, and make eurekas. And he's very, very eloquent in his, in this philosophical treatise um, at the end of his life. But he makes the point that we should always strive for new constants that supersede the old, old constants. And we should never allow ourselves to plateau and to become encrusted in one set of constants. Um, and of course, he was seeing the rise of a new school of mathematics. A new school of, of statisticians who are trying to take control of the narrative of what science was by saying all we were allowed to do is impose probability theory onto the domain of physics or biology or, or even the human mind um, to describe where things might be, kind of like rolling a dice, but never with the idea that we could discover underlying principles ever more perfectly by tapping into that musical, creative, reasonable space that people like Planck and his associates from that older generation were tapping into. So I think to the degree that we always have that idea that there's a relationship between the ontological existence and the, the, the ever evolving, changing uh, mapping of hum the human mind's ability to know it ever more imperfect or ever less imperfectly, um, then we, we can sort of walk that philosophical line pretty well. But as soon as we try to assume that there is this absolute endpoint to knowledge, right? And, and we have to fit the universe into whatever our language is, we, we run into big problems. Uh, and, and it opens the door to all sorts of forms of corruption on every level. Um, and, and what Stephen went through in his, in his presentation regarding how society tends to run the risk of falling into decay and decline and collapse whenever it uh, misuses its, uh, its technologies that it discovers. Um, that's yeah. what happens. We lose those, we, those civilizations disappear. So the moral and the cultural and aesthetic evolution have to occur. Uh, I, I would say, I, I was going to say at the same pace, but I would say at a faster pace than the rate of, of scientific discoveries, uh, you know, and their technological applications as well for that, that paradox that Plato warned about that Solon had heard about the, you know, from the temple of Amon. Um, we have to, to avoid that paradox. Uh, we have to do that. We have to have that cultural, aesthetic, moral, evolution happening too, you know? So that, that, would, that was my thought. I don't know if, um, mm. Stephen, you have another thought or should I go on to uh, another question? No, no, I think that's good. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Uh, Gabe has a really juicy three, threefold question. Gabe, why don't you uh, put that into words? You are mon ami on mute. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, first of all, uh, I just want to say thank you for this presentation. Um, 
I just want to mention just before the questions that it, it feels so good and liberating to uh, that you decided to go there and that we can speak about these things in, uh, in a way that's logical and rational and intelligent because it's so easy to, to, uh, to discriminate these ideas and uh, censor even yourself before you talk about these things. So I just want to say thank you, first of all, for this group and this place. Uh, that's very good. Uh, that's very nice. Um, so I, I just want to do the questions in uh, two times. Uh, the first one is really more uh, like maybe a quick answer that I would uh, be asking for you. So um, it, can you confirm or deny that there's a, uh, I, I heard that recently, like I think two weeks ago, that when uh, pilots learn to fly, that they need to look at the charts as if and fly as if the earth was flat uh, uh, because they cannot um, like use the globe uh, as a projection of the maps to fly the airplanes. Is that something that you've ever heard or, or, uh, or learned in your personal uh, history? I haven't encountered that sort of question in, in my operational flying days where uh, they're well behind me, so to speak. Uh, but in my experience, the, the pilots, um, they were thinking more in terms of flat maps versus globe. Now, they did think three-dimensionally because they're always conscious of altitude. But in terms of flying, you know, as opposed to consciously flying a great circle path or visually uh, uh, imagining a sphere, uh, it was more uh, uh, two-dimensional planar type thinking with an with a added vertical component, if you will. I don't know if that answers it, but I, I, from what you're describing, I haven't encountered that or I did not encounter that sort of thought in my flying days. Yeah, no problem. No, I was just curious about what was your, uh, your personal uh, encounter with any of no, or none of this, uh, this idea. Uh, so the second question is about the, um, the placement of the stars, because I was afraid to ask my question before we started the comments, but then uh, I, did, I just saw that everyone was going right into these, uh, these deeper rabbit holes. So uh, I'm curious to, um, to think about the, 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 the history of the stars. You know, you mentioned yourself about the Orion's belt, right? That it was the same place in the sky uh, 2000 years ago as it will be in 2000 years, for example. Um, so like, is it logical to, to how, how can we explain this logically if we consider the, the whole interaction of all the spirals that we're going through in the cosmos in your point of view, right? So for example, if we're always spinning, uh, the solar system is spinning, the galaxy is spinning and it, all of that is moving in the cosmos. So shouldn't the stars be moving uh, relative to our point of view? Um, th well, they are. And some of them are obviously at, at huge uh, astronomical velocities. So science has figured that out. But because they're so incredibly distant um, that the angular change is, is minute over huge human time spans effectively. So, and, I, and I, I've read some articles, for example, that suggest that, uh, you know, if you look at the Australian Aborigines, for example, some of the asterisms or the imaginary constellations, if you will, the imaginary grouping of stars into a picture, some of those asterisms might go back tens of thousands of years. So yes, everything is moving in the universe, but some of it is so, most of it is so incredibly distant from us that we don't perceive the relative motion. So the angles between the stars from our perspective stays the same. And you know, year after year, rotation after rotation, from our perspective, it looks essentially the same. Not the planets, which is why they were the wanderers, not the moon, we know it's much closer, but you, you sort of have that dichotomy that even though we now know uh, the universe is moving, the, the galaxy and all the, the, the constituent elements, from our perspective and our time frames, our, our human time frames of thousand years, they don't appear to. Right, so that's the classical um, classical explanation. All right, excellent. Well, thank you. So there's no chance in your uh, personal opinion and conclusions that the Earth is indeed flat? It is a sphere? Uh, I would defer to the Greek observation that the first thing you see on a ship as it approaches you on the horizon is the mast. And as it gets closer and closer, uh, you get to see more and more of the vertical element going down until it's within your full field of view. So. To me, that kind of thought experiment back to the, I believe it was the Greeks who observed that, uh, argues for the earth being spherical or roughly spherical. Awesome. Well, I just wanted to make sure that uh, 
that was put out of the way. So thank you very much again. That was an amazing presentation and uh, I'll leave the floor for the next questions. Thank you, Gabe. Okay, so far we've got two more questions. Uh, I'll call on Doug. I, I see you got a few thoughts oh, that you've thrown into the chat there. He's here yeah. somewhere. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, Doug. Oh, good, all right. Um, on crust displacement, uh, Stephen did, by the way, Stephen, thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentation. On oh, that. you're welcome, Doug. And uh, did Hackwood, because I'm not familiar with his work, I'm afraid. I know the name, but not familiar with the work. Did he address the idea that's floating out there that the massive dinosaur die off and the change was a function of crust displacement as opposed to, or in addition to the common meteor theory? Um, so going from memory, and I, and I did not delve back into Hapgood's earth crust displacement in preparation for this lecture. I, I've, I've read the book a number of years ago. Um, I get caught I, there too. Yeah, I, I, I don't recall him mentioning uh, the dinosaur era going back quite that far, okay. uh, but I do recall him talking about uh, the era of the die-off of, of um, uh, megafauna, for example. So one example that still uh, resides with me is he discusses the uh, frozen woolly mammoths in Siberia. Yes, yes. And what's really interesting, and I didn't know this till I read Hapgood, uh, is that their hair type is, is uh, been determined by experts to be more like the lions and tigers. It's more a warm weather fur than the woolly right. sheep type stuff that we would associate from the north. So he sees these frozen carcasses. Uh, some of them still have food in the stomach. And he was arguing that that's evidence of a, a kind of a rapid shift north of the area. Exactly. And if you think and if you think about the, the violence of the geology, you'd have mass volcanism going on and, and almost a nuclear winter happening as well. So the sunlight would be cut down and you could actually have a glaciation onset or at least uh, the onset of severe winter type weather for a number of years. So, so he does get into that sort of thinking. Um, I'd have to go back and revisit it to think if he actually looked at it as a causal factor for the dinosaur's yeah. demise. And, and of course, there are other works now coming out. There's a growing and emerging scientific consensus that around, uh, I'm going to say around 12 to 13,000 years ago, there was an extinction level event, comet strike uh, centered on Hudson's Bay. Uh, when you look at the, the geological evidence of all the dis, uh, dead megafauna, there's a lot of uh, evidence of a catastrophe at the time and, and charred remains and so on and so forth. So that would have been the uh, proverbial massive thermonuclear air detonation. Yeah. Um, so there are other possibilities and there could be that uh, there's truth in a number of these theories and then you have to put the puzzle together. But uh, in terms of what you were asking with Hapgood and earth crust displacement, I, I don't recall that specifically for dinosaurs, but certainly for the later uh, mass die-offs, uh, he offered explanation. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Jerry. Oh, thanks. Well, oh, thanks, Stephen. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, unfortunately, it's been about 30 years since I read Hapgood's book, so I don't remember too much. But uh, <clears throat> the uh, earth crust displacement theory, some other people have suggested that maybe um, the uh, tilt of the earth change, you know, the North Pole, South Pole axis, that had changed, and I remember reading about, uh, you know, the North Pole changes. It's not where we see it. It changed. There's a precession of the equinox. That's what I'm looking for. Yep. I think it's like a 20,000 year cycle or something, so that what we know as the North Pole won't be the North Pole in thousands of years from now. But my question is. I wanted to know if you've ever read the books by uh, an Indian scholar named Tilla. He wrote one on Orion and the other, the Arctic home of the Vedas. He did an analysis of the Vedic hymns. I think he was working with certain German people and Analyzing the astronomical sightings that are, you know, written into the Vedic hymns, 
he determined that the vernal equinox at the time they were written was in Orion. So they dated that to, I don't know, four or 5,000 years ago. And uh, the other one in the Arctic, uh, home of the Vedas, he um, determined that the actual sightings for their astronomical readings must have come from uh, far north than where they are now in India. And he didn't really come up with a date for that, but that kind of ties into the maps you were showing about how did they have a map of Greenland and able to show the mountain ranges and everything, unless it was in a period when it was in the uh, the warming part of the ice age cycles or something else caused it, maybe the earth crust movement or perhaps the change of the tilt of the earth. But I was just wondering if you had any ideas on that, just throw out it. Well, no, that's quite interesting. And there are other works on, uh, I guess, different questions in the field of dating that do use processional astronomy to make arguments in that, uh, you know, if you look at the equinoxes or solstice and, and uh, whatever constellation a certain star rises, so that this comes up in some theories about uh, the Giza complex, for example, uh, you know, when you have the heliacal rising of uh, Sirius, what's the background constellation in terms of precession? Uh, and, and just a, a quick refresher on precession. So you have this axial tilt like this, uh, it doesn't change where the North and South Pole are on the Earth, but it's kind of like the wobbling top. So with reference to inertial space, it, it kind of points to a different constellation as you go in. And it's how you view things from the equator and, and what constellations in the background when you, when you have the sunrise happening type of thing. But it's a fascinating field. I'm not familiar with that Indian scholar that you mentioned, but I believe those types of inquiries have merit, even if they're not precise. Um, and, and they're part of this building, a, again, a cumulative body of evidence suggesting that uh, our knowledge of later history and deeper history is, is incorrect or, or missing things. Uh, I've read that uh, uh, in, in around Teotihuacan in South America, there's a, a, was apparently a Polish researcher, researcher who used archaeoastronomy to, to kind of assess after years of research that the site dated back 13,000 years Again, you can use astronomical dating and, and back plotting, if you will. So that uh, approach to, to uh, intellectual inquiry, I think, is valid. Uh, not that it can necessarily stand on its own, but it's certainly part of building the cumulative body of evidence. And, and I agree with you that it does have merit. It's worth, worth looking into. I have a, a question as well. I, I personally... Um, I'm somewhat partial. I'm, I'm not um, committed to this, but I'm, I'm very partial to the uh, expanding Earth or expanding planetary theory. Um, it's something I just started looking into a couple of years ago and, and I haven't really delved into it as deeply as I should, though I find that the concept has been around for quite some time um, and does resolve a lot of the paradoxes. Um, and there's different approaches to it regarding whether the different planets in the solar system are expanding gradually or whether they're expanding in like quantum uh, fluctuate, like, you know, increments. Um, some of it though does account for why you have a, an increasing, a, a constant gradient of, uh, of age when they do the, the radio carbon dating and other forms of dating in the seabeds of the oceans, especially in the Pacific and the Atlantic, you have a, a constant like um, youth that builds up into the center where you have a, a certain, you know, direct cut all the way from the, Ar the Arctic to the, the Antarctic, and also the same thing for the, the well, both oceans. Um, and there's a variety of things too, also, you know, that deals with the, the issue of, of gravitational fields, gravitational forces that would be reduced over time that would account for why pterodactyls could exist that today, we know that pterodactyls, according to the current geometry and the weight of their, their bone density and everything else, they, I think there was a study that, that basically claimed that they had to, the gravitational field had to be something like three times less intense for such a, um, an animal to fly, unless these big wings were just there to be dragged around, you know, <laughs> while they were walking. Um, do you have any thoughts about, about that theory and, and how it might complement or not um, the Earth crust displacement theory? 
Um, uh, that's a good question. I know there, there are obviously, you know, if you're a, an electric universe type person, you, you question the nature of gravity. Um, you know, I forget the English physicist who uh, uh, earlier on realized that one of the implications of general relativity was that gravity must weaken over time. Um, that's just what you accept general relativity. Uh, it's an interesting question. You know, if, if you go back to my, uh, uh, that group that suspects that on Mars there are archaeological ruins that encode a higher dimensional physics. Um, some of the thought and some of the writings I've read in that domain suggest that um, a lot of manifestation of physical phenomenon has to do with actual physical geometry of the solar system and the influence that the bodies have upon one another. So, um, uh, and in fact, there was even an RCA study from the 20s that found that uh, the background HF radio noise or static level uh, was statistically a function of the geometry primarily between Saturn and Jupiter with respect to the sun, which kind of reinforces that sort of thing, thinking. So, um, I'm willing to entertain the possibility that, that gravity is a force and possibly um, the size of the earth or the impact on, on species on it could be variable over time. Um, I don't have any further more detailed knowledge in terms of specific theories though. So I would, I would have to leave it at that. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right. I think we'll, we'll round it out with Marty who I see is, is bubbling and bursting with concepts uh, that he's, <laughs> That he's writing in the in the chat area, Martin. Would you like to uh, to have a parting a parting thought to share? There we are. Actually, I put my parting thought in the chat section, and I think I've told quite enough already. But again, Stephen, thank you. It was a joy. Uh, I never actually dreamed that I would find in my own lifetime someone else wild enough, reckless enough, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> equally and uh, badly courageous enough to give Hapgood's wonderful work the time of day and wonderful treatment. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You know, it's, a, it's a mutual admiration society and a mutual love. <laughs> well, with that, thank you again. I think we, we all really got a lot out of this. And so the fact that you took the time to really just share this amazing wisdom and the fact that you you are you have an, a, a great experience as a submarine hunter, I think played very, very importantly into the quality of your research and the language. I really appreciated the the language that you you used to get across to communicate what we know and what we don't know, just in how you spoke. And that's hard to do. A lot of people will will use a very charged absolutist language, which uh, cuts the mind off of possibilities. And the idea of cumulative evidence, I think, the, the idea of triangulation, if we can't know absolutely 100% the answers to certain things we're looking for, we have to be able to be flexible enough to triangulate from a variety of, of, of directions, the way you were, you were taught to do and trained to do in practical observational astronomy and, and navigation. Uh, that's so useful. And it's such, it's such a, a, quali a natural quality of the mind that we're, that's so absent and hard to come by in this current society. So I really appreciate the approach that you took and bringing that, that practical knowledge that you have to share. And, and the fact that you were able to condense it in such a short period is great. So thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Oh, thank you, Matt. Pleasure. All right. And I hope